two. Hey, this is Michael Van Osh. Welcome to the Hark Journal, where we send you a two-minute meditation every day based on Shakespeare's wisdom to help you have a better day, a better life, and a better career. Continuing our interview series here today, and really pleased to have two of the uh, leaders of the International Shakespeare Center in Santa Fe. We have Robin Williams, president of the ISC. Hi, Robin. Hi. And Hello, Ariana Carp, or Ariana Carp. Which way, which way should I say it? Ariana. Ariana Carp, the artistic director of the ISC in Santa Fe. Ladies, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us, Michael. <laughs> We're thrilled to be here. Well, good. I'm glad. Let's let's get right into it. And I'll, I want to introduce you formally in a little bit, but Robin, maybe tell us, since you're the founder of the International Shakespeare Center there in Santa Fe, tell us a little bit about the center and 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 how, how long it's been going and, and really uh, why you started it. Yeah, we started it. Well, I've had my reading group since 2002, so already deeply embedded in that. But in 20, was it 2015, the Folger sent out a call across the nation where they would bring a first folio to every, every city, one city in each state. And they had, a, it was a competitive thing. You had to turn in this bid with all the programming you were going to do around it. And Santa Fe won the bid from me. It was, the bid was put in from me and another um, scholar. And um, then, so, so we had so much programming going on that we thought, heck, why don't we turn this into a thing? We have a very big name, <laughs> International Shakespeare Center, yeah. for a very small corporation, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we have to do that, yes? So we started it and it's been uh, really wonderful and exciting, and, but we don't, we don't claim a monopoly on Shakespeare in Santa Fe. We partner with other people who are doing Shakespeare. We encourage everybody to do Shakespeare stuff. So we create a collaborative kind of environment. Yeah, it sounds great. And, and you've got a lot of stuff going on. Obviously, none of us have any uh, quote unquote live theater going on at the moment, but, and uh, we'll get into that too. So I'm looking forward to that. So Ariana, you're the artistic director. How long have you been associated with the ISC? And tell me a little bit about what you do. Absolutely. So as the planning for that, the sort of month of, I believe it was, was it February? of February in New Mexico. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, feet of snow. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> I got a call from Carol Farkas, who is the other founder of the ISC, and we had worked together for many years with a company, the Young Shakespeare Players in Madison, Wisconsin, which is where I got all of my early theatrical training and became obsessed with Shakespeare from the age of like 12. <laughs> and she had moved to Santa Fe and had met Robin and they had this incredible idea and they won the bid and they were able to get in touch with some of the the heads of drama, the head of voice and the principal of Lambda, the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, which is where I got my master's degree. And they were bringing these three instructors out to do these public workshops as part of this whole month long sort of festivities around the folio. And they had said, yeah. it would be really great if we had some of our American alumni there so we could sort of demonstrate the kinds of training that we do. And Carol obviously, obviously knew me and I had just graduated a year before. And so she said, hey, are you interested in coming out? I was like, sign me up. And I sort of brought it to the rest <laughs> of my graduating class that we had formed a, a company together in New York. And I sort of said to everyone, hey, anyone want to come to Santa Fe with me? And of the like 19 people, I think like 18 of them were like, absolutely. So then we thought, <laughs> well, if we're all coming out here, we might as well put together a show. Yeah. So I put together a little show called Dames of Thrones, the Women of Shakespeare's Histories, which was a sort of nice. compilation of a whole bunch of scenes from the history plays with all of these very sort of powerhouse female characters that we get to see. And I'm a huge fan of the history plays. I think they're very underrated. So then we, we all came out and we got to participate in the workshops. We did Dames of Thrones. And then later that year, we brought out 
two productions, uh, Twelfth Night, which we performed in Meow Wolf, which is this wonderful, crazy art installation. I never quite know how to describe it. And then we also performed Merchant of Venice at a local high school theater. So all of the stuff that we do is always about sort of this trinity, as it were, of community outreach and education really being the sort of pillars of the ISC, I think. And then performance sort of came as a natural development out of that. And so then I believe it was 2017, I was so thrilled the board of the ISC asked me to be the artistic director. So I've been that since early 2017 and got to come out and be a part of that King Lear production. I was, Mm. I got to play Regan, which was great. It was my, I think, fifth time in King Lear in some capacity, but it was a, it was a thrilling experience. And then last year I got to direct Henry the fourth part one and be a part of measure for measure. And I was looking forward to directing Julius Caesar this past summer. Although of course, all of that was canceled because of COVID. So yeah, yeah. Sorry. That was a little long winded. (laughs) You both are doing so, so much. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. I was so glad to, you know, come across uh, your site and then meet both of you. So I'm looking forward to it. Let me introduce you more formally for the folks that are listening. And I've got your bios here, so I do want to read some of them. So so let's start with you, Robin, president of the ISC. You're also the director of iReadShakespeare.org, and we're going to get into that because that's one of the really important things we want to talk about here. But you have a PhD from Brunel University, London, in the history and future of reading Shakespeare out loud and in community. And you've taught Shakespeare courses in places as disparate as cruise ships to universities, both in Santa Fe and in London. And I like this, with a special fondness for working with people who feel Shakespeare is beyond them, because I know there's a a huge population out there that that does, and I was one of them at one point, and uh, it really makes a difference to be, as you know, be introduced or coddled, as I was, into (laughs) learning more about it and then really enjoying it, so love that. You're an award-winning author of more than 70 computer and design books, Uh, and you've founded several... What's that? My other life. My yeah, previous right, life. Right. We all have them, right? I love it. I want to hear about that. And you're working currently, it says, on a series of Shakespeare playbooks edited and designed specifically for groups reading the plays out loud oh, in discussion. There they are right there. Excellent. <laughs> and there's uh, on iReadShakespeare.org, which I'll put in the show, in the show notes. There's uh, some really good examples of that, too. You're uh, retired as an active member of TheaterSantaFe.org and an advisory board member of the New Mexico Actors Lab, an associate trustee of Shakespearean Authorship Trust in London at the invitation of Mark Ryland. So, wow. <laughs> Welcome. Congratulations. I, I, you know, I just, all the stuff you've done is amazing. Let's talk a little bit about I Read Shakespeare, because that's one of the major things that's going on right now, and then we'll switch over to Ariana. Yeah. I I started my first Shakespeare reading group in 2002 with just a bunch of us who said, hey, let's just do it. And it's still going on. We call it the first Friday club because Ben Johnson had his group at the Mermaid Tavern. I have a mermaid tattoo from when I was 18 years old. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. We won't ask where. where, What? We won't Uh, ask where. Yeah, don't ask where. Yeah, don't. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were reading and and really enjoying it. And I kept hearing, oh, you're not supposed to read the plays. You must only see them on stage. And I still hear that. I was in a, a conference thing just a few weeks ago. And in the chat room, everybody's saying, oh, you shouldn't read the plays. Oh, you mustn't read the plays. And so... Um, That really annoyed me. (laughs) And when I had an opportunity to get my doctorate, I got a master's at Brunel University in Shakespeare studies. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find out why, why we have this thing about you're not supposed to read Shakespeare. And it turns out that's a fairly new theory. It's only about 75 years old that we've been told not to read Shakespeare. And so I was able to chart the, the, 
path of how this came to be, there is an actor, Henry Irving, very famous actor in 1891, he wrote a preface for a new edition of Shakespeare and he said he called it Shakespeare the playwright. His first sentence is, I'm so sorry to profane the name of Shakespeare with playwright, but really the plays are good on stage, which is one of the many indications of the fact that everybody read them. I traced a Shakespeare reading group to the early 1700s, the Lady Shakespeare wow. Club, and they were instrumental in forcing more performances on stage that weren't usually performed. So Henry Irving said, oh really, Shakespeare's plays are, are good on stage too. 110 years later, Lucas Earn, a scholar, has to say, oh really, I know the plays are meant for the stage, but they're really good reading too. So it's <laughs> gone through this whole thing and the problem you know the reason why well in the early 1900s late 1800s two cigarette brands had shakespeare trading cards in the cigarettes Typhoo tea had trading cards shakespeare trading cards in their boxes of tea and whitman chocolates when they first got started in like 1905 to entice you to buy a box of chocolates <laughs> they included a little leather bound Shakespeare play in the box of chocolates. Oh, here, this will this will make you buy it because and the reason Shakespeare was so popular in popular culture is because people were reading the plays. People were reading them in the thousands of late women's clubs across the country. They were mm -hmm. reading them at the Victorians had a very important um, uh, family reading night. Families would gather around and read at night in in the 20th century, the 1900s, there was essentially a new complete works printed every six weeks, a different edition. Today, I mean, there were, I don't know how many. Today we have six, six. And most of them are, are made for scholars or for students. So my mission is to take it back to the rest of us. I come from a Macintosh background, you know, the Mac is for the rest of us. And, yeah. and Shakespeare should be for the rest of us. You know, we, we need to be the kind, we can easily be the kind of people who buy our cigarette brands. Yeah, I don't smoke. <laughs> Based on, oh, I need to get the, the Ophelia. Yeah. That's the only thing missing from my, my cards. So, and the other thing about, what bothers me about saying that Shakespeare's only for performance is that one, we get to see Midsummer Night's Dream and Romeo and Juliet 50 times, and we never get to see Coriolanus live or Winter's Tale or Cymbeline. And two, it means I'm a passive observer of what actors or academics want to present to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I'm reading it and my readers, we have a personal relationship with the place. We don't have to just accept what we see on stage, which is always an interpretation. A hundred percent, it's an interpretation. And as you know, being familiar with the plays, there's lots of interpretations. Sure. If the only Hamlet you ever see is Mel Gibson's, you think Hamlet wanted to have sex with his mother. <laughs> and you assume, oh, Shakespeare thought that Hamlet was having sex with his mother. So as readers, we get a personal reaction, a personal interaction with the plays and readers become terrible critics of <laughs> <laughs> performers. They didn't understand that line. Oh my gosh, they, they eliminated that whole scene. But that's what I most enjoy is people finding a personal connection with these amazing works mm. instead of going, having, instead of only being able to go through the priesthood. It was, mm, there's a whole list of things about how Shakespeare became difficult. Part of it because women do Shakespeare. I can actually prove to you that it's been women that saved Shakespeare from oblivion. And in the, wow. when Oxford University opened up to women, allowing women in, until the 70s, literature was considered a soft option to draw off the weaker candidates. That's actually in writing on their site. Wow. But in the early 1900s, when there was a push to put Shakespeare into university, because women were so involved with Shakespeare, 
there was great resistance because if women could do it, it doesn't have the intellectual rigor necessary for university. Mm. So that created this whole industry of making Shakespeare difficult, which is what, and then taking it away from readers, which has led to this whole thing of, oh, you must only see Shakespeare on stage. And the side effect of that is it's difficult sometimes to get people to a play, to see it. Yeah. Because sure. we're no longer, it's no longer just part of our, our culture, our everyday culture. So that's my mission too. More readers makes more audience. Because of course yeah, we absolutely. want to see a play after we read it. Yeah. 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 And Robin. <laughs> and so, and so I read Shakespeare.org. Is that, um, does that provide a place where other people can start their own reading groups as well? Or what's it the has, purpose of the, of the... Yeah. I have a PDF that is downloadable for free on how to start your own reading group. I have a list of the reading groups. I need to update it. Reading groups in the country and how around the world, actually. And each one describing their process. You know, we pick a name out of a hat. We assign parts ahead of time. Some groups go really slow. My current two groups, two public groups, are close readers. And that came about, the group decided that. We started out just reading the place. You know, we get through an act in two hours. Yeah. But then as we started reading more and more, we started going more and more slowly. And, oh, what does that line actually mean? And till now, at this point, it will take us six or seven months to get through Othello. It took us two hours to get two hours to get through the first 13 lines of to be or not to be. <laughs> 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 Which not everybody likes, but I'm in several other reading groups that read, you know, in very different ways. Some just read straight through, some pause a little bit. There's all different ways of doing it. And each group will find its own pattern. Yeah, and I did, I, on your website, I saw, I looked through some of the PDFs too and, and downloaded them. And it, it really is so helpful to be able to, ha you know, to, to have what you've laid out there as far as here's the line, here's what exactly it means. And, and in all the detail like that too, I mean, sure, it would take a lot longer, but you get so much more out of it. Yeah, I, I don't, in my reader's editions, I don't, they're not No Fear Shakespeare where I transpose the line. I'm trans, um, oh, I thought I turned, I did turn that off. Where I explain it, I just, um, um, I invented this thing I call a substitution gloss where you can, mm -hmm. it's right in the same line where there's a little dot. If you don't feel comfortable saying moiety, you can, scan your eye over here and say portion instead. And then the line becomes clear to you and yes. others. So my editions are specifically for readers reading out loud together in a group. Although Carol, who run, uh, my co-founder, who runs a youth group and adult actors, she's found them indispensable for actors too, because and there are lots of questions. There's no answers. Why is she doing this? There's not an answer book anywhere <laughs> Just yeah. for groups to talk about things. And we've used the additions for all of our, all of our productions as our, yeah. as our base text. I mean, it's been really, really useful, <laughs> very helpful. I can see why. I can see why. Yeah, they're, it's brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, more and more people need to be aware of this because it's just, it really it is so great. So, yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> well, I, thank you. Well, let, let me introduce Ariana a little more uh, deeply here, and then we can talk about uh, what you've got going on, too. So, again, I'll read part of your bio here, but you're, as you said, you're, you're based in New York City. You're an actor, director, educator, and cellist. Very cool. And the artistic director of the uh, International Shakespeare Center in Santa Fe there and co-director of the Youth Shakespeare Festival, Santa Fe. Uh, you're an alum, as you mentioned, of Lambda with a master's degree in classical acting for professional theater, and also an alumna of Reed College with a BA in uh, literature and theater. And as you mentioned, received your early theatrical training at the Young Shakespeare Players in Madison, Wisconsin, which I've seen a lot about. And you also, and I wanna get into this, you have a couple of podcasts going that are new one called Tabling the Podcast, and tell us about that and then the other one that just started as well, because these are, are really interesting to Shakespeare fans as well. 
Absolutely. So actually tabling is sort of a revival of a podcast that I started with some dear friends of mine after we graduated from Lambda in 2014. And we sort of ran on and off from 2014 to 2017. And with the pandemic happening again, we all just got a little too busy, but I thought like, what a great time to sort of reactivate this and maybe just change it a little bit and work with the ISC to create a whole bunch of content. So tabling the podcast is sort of one half of this project that I'm undertaking with the ISC to come up with an entire complete uh, radio play canon of of all of the plays of Shakespeare. I'm also writing original music as well and just putting it in, you know, as sort of at the beginning of each track, as if, you know, you were seeing, you've got to write the scene change music. It's just tiny little bits here and there. But so, So that's the sort of one half and that the radio plays themselves, they're broke down in terms of tracks by scene. So that if you're, for example, if you're teaching the play, I would hope that it would be maybe a a useful tool for you. If you're like, if you would like to listen to this, here's a free radio play. You can send your students with a whole bunch of different actors. And then the other half of that is the tabling, the podcast, which is for each act and actually for some plays depending on how long it is there's there's more than one for each act there is a approximately two hour discussion as we sort of did our first read through of the play and stopped and started very similar to what robin's doing and sort of discussed a lot of the time we discuss text and character and sort of, oh, what would you do if you were trying to stage this? And mm-hmm. hmm, how do we connect that over to there? And how do you emphasize these antitheses? And oh my gosh, what a bunch of repetitions and look at that rhythmic irregularity, you know? So these are the kinds of things that as a director and as an actor, I focus on. My, my methodology is always the text is the first point. Um, of contact and the last point of contact. So as much as we do, you know, character work, and that's really important, it has to, it has to interact with the text. I'm, I'm sort of, I don't know, I think I've just seen so many sort of concept Shakespeare productions where it's like, what if we did Hamlet in space or whatever? And I'm sort of like, what if we understood what was being said on stage? So there's sort of like both of our projects are very much dovetailed around. The text comes first and yes. of utmost important is, is that we understand what we're saying. Cause it's, it's, it's really extraordinary how many times sometimes we'll see a production and you'll go, wow, somebody didn't know what they were saying in that moment because I didn't understand what they were saying. So to us, you know, it's like 90% of the work is, do you understand what you're saying and how can you convey that to the audience? And I must say having Robin's readers as a huge makeup, a huge number of our, of the audience, we have the most incredibly educated audience on the play. I had a wonderful, really fun interaction with Robin's group last summer or two summer oh, time, two summers ago that were reading uh, Measure for Measure. And they had a huge abhorrence to the Duke who I was playing. And yeah. we had a really interesting, lively discussion about this weird, strange, opaque character and how how he fits within the play. And you know, I, you know, they they have a certain perspective on it, and I had a different perspective, which was I have to play this, and I can't sort yeah. of make a moral judgment about him, but I have to, in my mind, sort of justify, you know, what he does. So it's it's really fun. I feel like all of our projects kind of come together and they're really about community building, right? The the community that comes to see the shows is very invested because they've spent a whole bunch of time looking at the text. So this is our our version of that, but for the the larger world, I'm going to have some guest directors coming in for a couple of the plays, which I'm really thrilled about. And I've already worked with recorded five plays so far and I'm in the process of 
editing and recording them, but I've gotten to work with over 50 actors from all across the country and Canada. So I'm looking to keep expanding the group of people because I, I always think that the more perspectives you can have on Shakespeare, the better. And everyone brings something different, which is why we keep investing in these investigations of Shakespeare as well. So both tabling and Radio Shakespeare Lab are live and they're available on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and Podchaser. And if there's any that I'm forgetting, please let me know because <laughs> I'm happy to submit them to more podcasting platforms. But I'm really right. thrilled about this project. I think it's going to be at least over a year of investment in this uh, project. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> so from a technical perspective, then, how are you getting everyone together to do it? Obviously, uh, they're in their own cities and you're recording that way or... Yes, yes. So I've been uh, setting up, <laughs> I feel like my life has been doodle polls and recorded Zoom meetings uh, recently. <laughs> but so I've been sort of casting each of the plays and then sort of finding a schedule that works for, for everyone involved. And I have between nine to 12 uh, cast members. So there's a lot of doubling up of, on roles. Sure. And then we sort of meet and discuss and we have a sort of one three hour session per act. And we, we do the start and stop. And then we do a second sort of uninterrupted read through. And that becomes the radio play. Mm -hmm. And hopefully informed by the things that we've discussed as we stopped and started. Sure, sure. Wow, what another great project. Fantastic. <laughs> so Robin, you've had as, uh, as leader of as one of the leaders and the founder of, of ISC, where are you now with the actual physical performance of, of plays? I mean, obviously nobody's doing them right now. So um, assuming this COVID relaxes and goes away and all that kind of stuff, where do you see that going in the future? Carol's talking, I think Ariana, about in a tent an open-sided tent outdoors in July or August. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. the thought at the moment. But we did have, a, we had a theater, our beautiful Swan Theater that we had to let go because we couldn't pay the rent on it anymore. Fortunately, sure. another acting company who has deeper pockets than us they're keeping it as a theater and, and part of the deal was we get to perform there once a year for a month. So after this year, we'll have that uh, theater space back again. Yes, yes. And we- Ariana, we, your thoughts on where you're taking this? Absolutely. It would be so wonderful. I, I, I think I, I speak for most people when I say, I, I really miss being in the room with other people. For me as a, both a director and an actor, the joy is what happens in the room and those discussions and that creative process. And, you know, I, I love the performances, but rehearsals are kind of my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. And I really miss that. And I really miss the, the sort of camaraderie. And I'm very hopeful that I would be able to come out and work with a group of actors in Santa Fe on Julius Caesar. Our, our rep season that was postponed was Julius Caesar and Coriolanus, the Romans. And we were, I was really looking forward to, so I'm doing those, but obviously we had to cancel. So I'm, I'm hoping that those will be the two next plays that we get to explore. We have a, a, a wonderful director in who, has done a lot of work with the Stratford Festival of Ontario, Ed Duraney, who is going to be uh, directing Coriolanus. And, and he was also going to be playing Mark Antony and Julius Caesar. So I hope that we get to continue this sort of very fun, uh, symbiotic rep company idea. It's pretty yeah. exhausting for the actors, I must say, <laughs> but it, it sure is fun to, to have the opportunity to get to work with a group of people on two shows at the same time. And, you know, you feel the resonances between plays. You feel that they, they frequently are in dialogue with one another. And it's, it's, it's really fun to sort of catch those in the, in the setting of a, of a rehearsal. 
So I'm very hopeful that we will get to do a sort of outdoor performances this coming summer and that enough people will feel safe in that environment. Although I, you know, who knows with this new strain, you yeah, know, it, right. it's, a, it's a lot of up in the air, but I am hopeful that we will return to performances and also those, those community outreach and educational uh, programs that we do, which are all about sort of building communities that up, they respond to the work and that feel more invested because they have more time. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. the reading groups, on the other hand, I'm really enjoying the Zoom reading groups. <laughs> <laughs> I only have to get dressed in the waist up. There you go. <laughs> I don't have to try. Right. Notice there. I haven't stood up yet, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we now have readers from uh, from the East Coast, from the West Coast, from Kentucky. We have a reader calling in from Germany. Nice. So it's really, it's actually forced us to, allowed us to expand. And so even though we will be able to come back to our reading group at some time, it's gotten bigger and broader and we can reach more people. So we will, even after we meet again in person, we will still continue the Zoom reading groups. I love it. You know, and, and the, the theme that you've both touched on that is what art is about is building community and you're, and you're doing so much of it, even though we can't do it like we normally would. And, and to me, that's, that's the most important thing. That's, that's the reason yeah. underlying that we do all of these things. And it's amazing the programs that you're, you're both doing and how the communities are, are are building and growing and that's fantastic. What's the website, and I'll put all this on the show notes, but what's the website for ISC? Can't remember off the International top of Shakespeare dot center. Dot center, got yeah. it. Yeah, center's the domain, that's... international Shakespeare dot center. Got and it. Ari, I need, I need you to get me the stuff to put the Radio Shakespeare on that site. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I, the, we're, we're hoping to have a sort of nice kind of almost like a library of the plays on the ISC website as they as they happen. And then the tabling the podcast.com has all of the episodes for now of both the Radio Shakespeare Lab and the tabling discussions as well. And tabling, by the way, I didn't really say this, but tabling comes from the industry term table work, which is the sort of first day of rehearsal of, of sort of sitting and going through the script and talking about this. And it's a wonderful uh, time in the rehearsal process. So it's a, it's a sort of representation of that, which normally yeah. is not a public thing. So we wanted to pull the curtain back a little bit and say, this is how we do it. Um, I like so. it. It's always a fun day too, because the pressure is at its least. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you first yes. sit down, right? You're just like, oh, hi, how are you? How are you? Okay, yeah. good. this is fun. <laughs> we're gonna well, go through this on a journey fantastic. together <laughs> that's right that's right i love it this has been this has been really good thank you so much both of you before i let you go i i have a question i ask all my interviewees and that is if shakespeare was on this zoom call with us and you got to ask him one question what would you ask him robin how about you start um, it's complicated for me. <laughs> I would say, wow, you invented all these amazing female characters, every one of whom is literate. Why didn't you teach your daughters to read and write? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's the first one. I, that's, that's a new one for me. I like it. All right, Ariana, you're up. Oh. I know you're thinking. Boy. <laughs> I feel like my life since the age of 12 has been leading up to this question. I don't know how I would put it into one, like, wow. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> We'll have to have you on again so that you can get a second one in, but you only get one. So just, oh, you know, man. no pressure. 
The only <laughs> line that's bouncing around in my head right now is my favorite Shakespeare line, which is, I wasted time and now doth time waste me from Richard II. And uh, I just... I would really love to know more about Shakespeare's philosophy of time, which seems to be such mm. a remarkable, punishing, joyful f- force within the plays in the sonnet. And where did that come from? Where, do, where does mm. that sort of conception of time, and I think we're all experiencing time in a different way during COVID. I'm just very fascinated by... Mm the particular Shakespearean construction of time. I guess that's yes. where, where I would leave it. I love it. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, stay on the line here after we say goodbye, both of you. But uh, thank you again so much, uh, everybody that's watching. This has been Robin Williams, the president and founder of the ISC, and Ariana Karp, the artistic director of the ISC, which is the International Shakespeare Center Santa Fe. It sounds like a great excuse to get back out to Santa Fe for me. So. <laughs> hopefully things will lift but thanks again so much stay on the line and we'll talk to you soon thank, thank you, you Michael. <laughs> take care